All right, everybody. Um, so I'm Nick Panzarella, <clears throat> founder of Wild Sal Tea. Uh, if you haven't already got some, um, it's in the ice chest. It looks like it should be full of red snapper. Dirty. Um, so just before we get into the nitty gritty, uh, Wild Sal Tea is not made with green tea or black tea. It's made with cassina. Cassina is the only native source of caffeine in North America. Uh, it's wild harvested here in Houston, uh, in New Caney to be exact. And uh, my production manager, Victor Gonzalez, is in the back. Um, so anyways, let's get into the story. Um, so just to start off, by a show of hands, who here can name a native plant to Texas? Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> okay, there's a couple. Okay, who can name a native plant that is edible here in Texas? Oh man, there's like three, okay. Uh, Y'all must not have got outside too much. Um, <laughs> let's go to the next slide. Please. <clears throat> so this is a prickly pear. This is native to Texas. This is a perfect example of a native edible. It's got a native fruit, uh, the prickly pear, or the tuna in Spanish. Uh, and then the pad is also edible as nopalitos and cactus. It's native to Central, South, and West Texas. Really popular with the Native Americans around the San Antonio area. Um, symbolic of Mexico, Texas. This is a native plant that we can eat. Um, so when I was a kid, when I was in elementary school, I wanted to know what were the edible plants that were from here, specifically from our region. You know, I was from Kingwood, which is North Houston, Piney Woods area. Um, I wanted to know what did the Native Americans live on and what were things that you couldn't get anywhere else in the world. Because um, a lot of Texan foods are unique. Barbecue is iconic here in Texas, but it's actually probably from Central Europe. Uh, it's a Polish and German tradition, Czech tradition. Um, that's why it's so popular in Central Texas. And cattle is not native to North America, so how is uh, beef ribs, uh, actually a native Texan product. Um, so as a kid, there's not much information. Most adults, I mean, obviously from this room, these are a lot of intelligent, creative people. There's not much knowledge about native foodways here. Um, so I hit the books. So I went to the library, and I went through uh, trail guides, foraging sections. I'd get big stacks of books. <clears throat> and one time I was leaving the, uh, the Kingwood Public Library, I had a big stack of books, and I bumped into my third grade teacher. And the first book on the top is Foraging Wild Mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she got, her eyes got real big, and she kind of like, you know, gave me a warning. But fortunately, I never got into the mushroom game. So, um, uh, but at the same time, I was in Boy Scouts. Uh, me and my brothers uh, were all Eagle Scouts. Um, and in Boy Scouts, to reach a certain rank, uh, you have to be able to identify a certain number of plants. For us, it wasn't a huge deal to, uh, to identify plants, but it was important. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, I did learn to identify one plant very well, and that's Yopon Holly. So I want to see those hands again. Who knows this plant? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. This, uh, not only is it a native plant, but it's a very common landscaping plant. Uh, it's a tree-like bush or a bush-like tree, depending on the environment it's growing in. It's got these little berries, which are toxic to humans, but are really good for wildlife, birds, small animals, eat them. Um, where I grew up in Kingwood, it's everywhere. There's these things called the green belts, and they're these trails that cross through the forest. Um, and then on both sides of the green belt, there's like walls of Yopon holly. Um, but not only here in Houston, in central Texas, uh, a lot of farmers will cut and burn acres of Yopon every year because it's like, it's a beast. It is a native plant, but left unchecked, it'll take over. Um, so without fires, without buffalo, things that were naturally here, or without forests, uh, it'll take over a prairie. And actually, uh, me and my family volunteered with the Katy Prairie uh, Preservation Alliance Association. Uh, and uh, like the whole day, all we did was cut and poison Yopon. Um, because it is native here, but it doesn't belong in the prairies. So um, uh, also, OK, the Yopon is probably most famous for this fact. Uh, with the southeastern tribes of the United States, it was used in a, uh, an important purification ritual. Uh, so that involved taking the leaves, taking the stems, and uh, brewing it in a giant cauldron, uh, really, really black. They brewed it really, really black. They would call it a black drink. Uh, and then they would drink it scalding hot, sometimes up to gallons at a time. Uh, and then they would ritually purify themselves and vomit. And so that's how we get the name Ilix Vomitoria. That's the scientific name of it. So uh, that's all I knew about the Yopan. Uh, my, my interest stopped there. Uh, but one day on a camp out in Boy Scouts, I met a scout who told me that he had actually taken the leaves and then made a tea with it. Um, and that horrified me. And I was like, why would you do that? Like, did you puke? Uh, and his response, he kind of laughed it off and said, no, it just tasted like regular tea. And so uh, I knew I was missing something. So uh, I, got, I was interested in Yopon specifically. I went back to these, um, these foraging manuals to see if I'd missed something. Because I'd never looked this up. I didn't think there was anything worth foraging on this plant. Um, so I went through and I saw that Yopon was listed as a coffee substitute. 
because it contains caffeine. So I don't know about y'all, but I thought that coffee, or sorry, caffeine was only in coffee and tea. I didn't think it was anything else, and I didn't think there was anything in Texas that had caffeine. Um, turns out this is the only native source of caffeine in North America, and the Native Americans knew that, and that's why it was a purifier for them. It was a psychoactive drug. Caffeine affects your central nervous system, um, and so there's a reason they saw it as important. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, when the first Europeans showed up in North America, the Spaniards, they arrived in Florida, 1400s or so. Coffee had not yet reached Spain and Europe. Coffee goes through Ethiopia, Turkey, Austria, and then gets in. So these Spaniards never had coffee in their life. They show up, they meet the Timucua Indians, Native Americans down there, teach them how to make casina. So casina is a beverage brewed from the leaves of the yopon plant. And so there's a quote by a, fan, a Spanish missionary down there. And he says, uh, there, is not, there is not a Spaniard or Indian who does not drink casina every day. And any day that a Spaniard does not drink it, he feels like he's going to die. <laughs> so <laughs> it's uh, the first example of caffeine withdrawal in America. Um, but uh, so not only that, the Native Americans were trading it all over the continent. It only grows down here on the Gulf Coast, uh, East Texas to Florida. But there's evidence of uh, pottery in New Mexico, Arizona, and uh, Indiana with casina residue on it. So these people, these cultures knew that it was important and they were trading it all over the continent. Um, up in the Carolinas, English settlers learned from the Spanish how to brew this tea. And so uh, there's, there's plantation recipe books that say uh, how to make casina tea. Um, during the Boston Tea Party. When we're throwing away China tea, Americans are starting to drink casino as a replacement, as a political act. Um, but why do we not know about it? Uh, the biggest issue is the decimation and the displacement of the Native American population. A lot of these guys got, were forcibly moved to Oklahoma where Yopan doesn't grow. Another big thing is that it's free. It grows everywhere. And so it was seen as a poor man's drink. Uh, in the Carolinas, there's a derogatory term for a poor person called a Yoponer, a man who drinks Yopan. So um, th that all interested me so much. The history was super cool, and it was a genuine Native American, like beautiful product that we could all use today. But, okay, here's a kicker. I read a Wikipedia article describing how black drink is made. <clears throat> so they were describing why the Native Americans drink it so hot. Apparently, uh, caffeine is 30 times more soluble at boiling temperatures. I misread that article thinking that Casina was 30 times stronger than coffee. It's totally incorrect, <laughs> but uh, it blew my mind. So I was in a frenzy. I was thinking, you know, more caffeine, more good. This is like a magic jewel I found in my backyard. Like, I have to do something with this. So uh, I, I get the idea. I want to start a, a company working with Yopan. So we'll set Yopan aside for a second. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Oh, hold it closer. Sorry. OK. Um, this is Pope Francesco. Uh, so when I was in college, I studied abroad in Italy, and I realized that my family is eligible for dual Italian citizenship, dual Italian-American citizenship. Um, I wanted to follow through on that, see if maybe we can get the citizenship. Maybe I can find a job in Italy. Maybe I stay there forever. I don't know. I just wanted to try things out. <laughs> so I saved up money. I worked uh, for a little bit. And then uh, let me do a little, little bit of this juice. Um, saved up cash, and I had a plan to go through South America first and then to Italy to put down roots. Um, the reason I wanted to go to South America was this beverage right here. Is anyone familiar with this? I saw a bottle of it in the back. Okay. Yeah, mate. Uh, so yerba mate is a genetic cousin of yopon. So that's another important fact. Uh, the way this works, this is the mate. Mate just means gourd. And then they fill it full with uh, the yerba mate, the plant. And then they put a filter straw in it and you pour hot water over it. And you could drink that like 20 times. You put more hot water, you drink it, and then you get a good caffeine buzz going. Um, so I wanted to see how they make that, because that's the closest thing to Yopon. And if there's a whole industry working with that, maybe I could learn something. So I went through South America, Brazil, Argentina. Uh, unfortunately, it was Carnival at the time, so I got nothing done. I didn't learn anything. So I took a flight from there, went to Palermo, Sicily. Um, and in Sicily, uh, I basically just got an apartment and traveled and hung out and cooked. And the reason I was doing all that is because I wanted to see how native foodways worked in different places. So not just South America, but also in Europe. Um, and one of the biggest things that struck me was how different people use the same plant differently. So the prickly pear from earlier, uh, the Spaniards, when they colonized Mexico, brought prickly pears to Europe. It's taken over Sicily. Uh, Sicily's a small island off of Italy. Um, it's probably more prevalent, the cactus is probably more prevalent in Sicily than it is here in Texas. But over there, they eat the fruit only. 
So they'll, um, they'll eat the fruit chill, they'll pick it off the plant. But if you tell them that you eat prickly pear, or the pad here in Texas, Sicilians lose their mind because they cannot conceive of that notion. Um, so I thought that was interesting, but also what I thought was interesting was the way that certain native food ways become emblematic of a culture. So yerba mate is a perfect example of that. Uh, in Argentina, being Argentine is drinking yerba mate. 90% of the population drinks mate every day. And that is a, tradi a tradition that they inherited from the native populations that were in Argentina. Um, I mean, the Pope, he's from Argentina, but even in Vatican City, he's sipping his little bombilla. Um, but also, uh, other native foodways are not so important. Um, Sicily is really famous for pasta and cannoli, but no one ever talks about how important uh, wild asparagus and wild fennel are. I, you know, harvesting that kind of stuff with my cousin added another layer of complexity that is part of being Sicilian, but it's not something you're gonna see in a poster or in a movie. Um, so that was interesting for me to see all these different things and, and also just seeing all the different fish in the markets. It was dope. So let's go to the next one. Um, when I was in Italy, I had a friend named Norbert. He's a German guy, he's from Hamburg. Um, and uh, we were talking about the future. I was telling him this idea of Yopan, maybe starting a company selling Casina. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I described it to him. So he proceeded to describe a product to me called Klub Mate. All right, so we're on this mate train. Uh, Klub Mate is a mate-based soda that they drink in Germany. It's super popular in the Berlin club scene in uh, an online gaming culture. But so in Berlin, you can go to a bar and order a vodka mate. They will, they'll give you a bottle of Klub Mate. You take a swig, you give it back to the bartender. They fill the empty spot with vodka, put their thumb on the top, invert it, and then they give it back to you. So it's unsanitary, but it's fun, and it's really popular. Uh, so I told Norbert, I said, I've got this idea for this product, but I don't think that people, I don't know, there's maybe a chance people in Texas won't be receptive to this weird plant with a weird history. And his response is, look, if there's a plant from South America, and it's so popular in Germany, why couldn't a plant from Texas be popular in Texas? So that week, I bought my ticket home, and I moved back to start Wild South Tea. Um, we go to the next slide here. Um, when, uh, when I moved back, um, I started the company like the first thing, like the first week. Uh, I had a boss that told me that if you want to start a company, the best thing to do is just start it right away. Don't think about it, just start it and you'll figure things out along the way. Uh, I have a quote my brother told me that uh, is re in response to that. It's that being an entrepreneur is 10% roller coaster and 90% hating yourself. <laughs> so. <laughs> It was so difficult to do this because <clears throat> there's no tea industry in America. We don't grow tea here. We drink tea and we, we bottle tea, but we don't grow and process tea. And no one grows and processes Yopon. This is a whole new industry with no information. The most information we have on how to process Yopon are, let's not say ancient, but 500-year-old uh, texts from Spanish and French missionaries describing what they saw Native Americans doing. So it's really like crude descriptions of, you know, like, oh, they took a leaf and they put it in a pot and then they boiled it and then they like vomited. And so, <laughs> so I wanted to know, I mean, what's the right way to do this? So I thought, okay, here's an idea. A lot of these people may not drink Yopan all the time, but we don't necessarily know that because I'm reading a book and I'm not talking to any Native Americans because the tribes that used to drink this aren't tribes you've never heard of. It's the Cherokee, it's the Creek Indians, it's the Alabama Cushada who live an hour north of Houston. So I was like, these people are still here. Let's, let's figure something out. So I didn't know, I didn't know any Native Americans. I didn't know an appropriate way to approach Native Americans. And so, out of weird happenstance, someone posts on Facebook about a group called Wiki Tongues. So, Wiki Tongues is a nonprofit with the goal of recording in video every language on the planet. You could do that because everyone's got a phone, everyone's got a camera in their pocket. You could video yourself speaking your native language, send it to us, we post it online, everything's gravy. We've got more information for language preservation, promotion, and education. Um, and this group needs volunteers. So I reached out, I've got a linguistics degree, I wanna to talk to Native Americans, I wanna see if maybe I can help with their languages and see if I can learn something along the way. So I still start volunteering with Wiki Tongues. Um, usually it's like, what I'll do is if I have an Airbnb host who speaks another language, I'll like record them, simple stuff at first. Uh, but eventually we established um, a partnership. I established the first official partnership with a Native American tribe for Wiki Tongues with the Tunica Biloxi of Louisiana. So the Tunica Biloxi, their language died in the 30s, and they're in the process of um, reviving it. And so they already, they already they have about two speakers. Um, they've got a long way to go, but they're doing good. 
And then we've also established a working relationship with the Alabama Cushata of Texas. Um, and then through all this, uh, I accidentally became the uh, community leader for North America for Wiki Tongues. So all volunteers in America now have to deal with me. Uh, and just because I followed up on one Facebook post. But um, with these Native Americans, we didn't learn anything really about Yopan. I don't know, I wanted to learn maybe like a word or two, and, and we learned the words for Yopan in their languages, but they, they're still not drinking it. And so um, we were able to give them, you know, whenever we go visit them, I bring samples and stuff, and they enjoy it. And for the last uh, Tunica language uh, immersion class, we were able to donate a bunch of Casina and Yopan um, for educational purposes, you know, so the kids can see, like, this is Yopan, um, which is cool. You know, we're reviving things. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, so Wild South Tea started it in 2015, basically two and a half years later. Uh, we're in 40 stores in Texas and Louisiana. We've got six flavors. We're mostly a bottled beverage uh, company. We do sell loose leaf online, but uh, bottles are our bread and butter. Uh, we've got six flavors, yeah, uh, sweetened with organic cane sugar. We use organic flavorings and natural flavorings. Um, and our mission is to bring wildness into people's lives one bottle at a time by reviving the American tradition of Casina with a positive uh, environmental and social impact. Um, so, yeah, our scope, we, we, can only, we can only reach that mission, we can only achieve that mission with an open mind and with curiosity. Like I said, there's, there's no book on how to do this. There's no book on how to start a whole new industry. There's barely any books on how to start your own beverage company, much less one made out of Yopon. So um, we've had to keep an open mind, and we've had to think about how to take solutions from different problems and how to make them fit with our problems. And we've had to be open to meeting anyone and everyone because um, you know, I'm trying to make a tea company, but maybe someone who's brewing can give me a lot of insight on how to you know, make a hot beverage and put it in a bottle. So um, it's, yeah, keeping an open mind also means keeping an open mind when an expert tells you that what you're doing is impossible. Uh, and experts aside, when we wanted to start this company, there was countless people that said starting a casino company would be impossible because they had just tons of reasons. Like, well, maybe the plant, maybe it'll run out of the plants, or maybe, I don't know, maybe it doesn't taste good, or maybe it doesn't bottle. And I don't know why they had all these questions or these, like, uh, arguments why it wouldn't work. Um, and one of the biggest things we saw was when we went to the farmer's market and we told people, this is the only native source of caffeine in America, people would laugh. And I don't know why, I started keeping like a, a, like a tally in my head about how many people laughed, because I didn't understand what was going on, what was funny about that. But I guess it was because like, if this, th if this is true, and why isn't Coca-Cola doing it? If there is a native source of caffeine in America, and it's free, and it's all over America, or all over the South, why isn't Nestle or Nestle doing it? And so, um, I think for us it was important to, to listen to these people and say, I hear you, I understand the facts, I understand your argument, but I need to find out for myself. And if I fail, that's fine, but I need to know if this can happen or not. Um, so I'll go to the last slide here. This is a Texas food pyramid. Uh, so our goal is to see if we can take a byproduct of a trash plant and make it into a southern staple. Something that's as important to us as apple pie or barbecue, right? So when I look at this, I think this is right, this is correct, but it's missing casina, and maybe crawfish, and maybe pho, a couple other things. <laughs> but, um, and so I, I think we could do this. And I guess the point to wrap all this up is that um, we don't know where we're going. Um, you might have an idea, or you might have a goal, but if you're not curious along the way, you might miss so many different paths that you never expected that you could have had. And so, whew, whew. <laughs> um, for me, curiosity led to all this. Right, traveling to Italy and, and getting our Italian citizenship, I have to go to the consulate today and get my ballot to vote in the Italian elections. Uh, I mean, we got, we got our citizenship for me and my whole family and, and becoming a community leader for Wiki Tongues and, and starting Wild South Tea. And even if all this fails, this was a dope path. And so um, I think, yeah, keeping an open mind and, and just being curious along the way will take you so far. So my question for all of you is, what are you curious about? <laughs>